Welcome to the Birth Launch Podcast, an empowering space for expecting and new parents to hear candid conversations with experts and learn how to craft your ideal birth. We will tackle the scary and weird questions that come up along the way and provide answers that are driven by science and evidence-based recommendations. I'm going to show you how to redefine parenthood and choose what's best aligned for you and your goals. With 10 years of experience in family education and a master's degree in human development and family studies, I'm ready to help you navigate pregnancy and explore your birth options to free yourself of fear surrounding childbirth. My goal is to help you have an informed and confident labor experience, plus an empowered and joyous postpartum. Hi, Emily. Welcome to the show. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm very, very excited for this conversation. I think this can be a scary topic to a lot of people. And I think that some of the data and facts that we talk about today, as I mentioned in the intro, may be a little triggering. So if you need to step away, here's your second reminder and your second permission to step away and take this episode in chunks as you can take it. It's nothing that you need to sit down and eat the whole well right now, right? But In terms of count the kicks and preventing stillbirth, tell us who you are, who's behind the microphone, and where do you fall into this puzzle? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. I am the CEO of a nonprofit organization called Healthy Birthday Inc. It was started by five women who all endured the loss of their daughters to stillbirth or infant death in the early 2000s. And after the loss of their daughters, they said to each other and looked at each other and said, we cannot be this sad or this angry the rest of our lives. We want to do everything we can to take our anger and our sadness and keep other families from enduring this kind of loss. And so what they did was They created a campaign called Count the Kicks that did exactly what you're talking about. They turned talking into stillbirth into something that is empowering and educational and not dark and scary. And that's what Count the Kicks is. Found it out of loss, but has saved countless lives. That's amazing. I'm so excited to talk about this, (laughs) even though it's a heavy and sad topic, you know, as blunt as it is. And, you know, our listeners know I can just kind of put it out there, but there will always be death in life, right? So there is a percentage of death within birth that is normal and expected. Today, and for Count to Kicks, we are talking about preventable death. We are talking about losses of babies that had we intervened a little sooner, had we had the tools or the knowledge to do something, to know what we're looking out for, these babies might not have been lost. So can we start out kind of there? Let's start out, what does our stool birth rates in America look like? Where have we seen big dips, fluctuations? Is it different across the country in different regions? Just talk to us about what we need to know going into this conversation. Sure. In general, in America, one out of every 173 pregnancies ends in stillbirth. One out of every 173. So chances are, you know someone who has endured the tragic loss of their full-term baby, or the definition of stillbirth is a loss of a baby at 20 weeks or greater during pregnancy. So it's not miscarriage. It's something that comes later in pregnancy after miscarriage. It's also not infant mortality. Infant mortality is when a baby is lost in the first year of life. So it's stillbirth is when a baby dies in utero, is born still in the 20th week or greater of pregnancy. Severe racial disparities persist in stillbirth. Black women are two and a half times more likely to endure a stillbirth than their white counterparts in this country. So one out of every 97 Black pregnancies ends in stillbirth. It is also much greater for Native Pacific Islander pregnancies. It's also greater for Indigenous pregnancies, which are actually on the rise. Stillbirth is on the rise among Indigenous families. And also Hispanic families are also at greatest risk of enduring a stillbirth. And so there are different geographic pockets that have worse outcomes. The South has some of the worst outcomes in the country, as well as Hawaii. And that speaks to that Native Pacific Islander increase, stillbirth rate increase among Native Pacific Islander families. So our worst rates are going to be among Black women in the South, but Black women 
anywhere are at greatest risk of losing their babies to stillbirth as well as native Pacific Islander women. And so our organization and our work, we really try to work alongside community-based organizations besides leaders in the community. A lot of doulas and doulas of color are real partners in this work. And we are, you know, we elevate their stories. We elevate their work within our work because they're critical in raising awareness about Count the Kicks and that there are tools and resources to hopefully improve outcomes. Yeah, that's amazing. I love to hear that about doulas. Okay, let's rewind a little bit. Why are we seeing such racial disparities? I'm from Mississippi, so the South piece of that makes sense to me. A lot of that, I think, can be blamed on kind of the spatial piece of the South, right? Things are much more spread out. Public transportation is not widespread down there. It's much, much harder for people to get to their appointments. That's generally what we typically find in the South. The South lags in almost all the things, unfortunately. But why the racial disparity? How how does that happen? I think research shows that it is a variety of factors, but I think that a lot of what research shows is that it does come back to things like systemic racism. And what I mean by that is when a woman of color speaks up and says to her doctor or her doula or her midwife and says, I've noticed a change in my baby's movements, something feels off today, she is more likely to be dismissed than a white woman. She's more likely to not be understood, not be heard, to be sent home, or to be given the wrong advice. Like, just go drink cold water and you'll be fine. So in lots of other ways that systemic racism can impact a woman of color. So not just being dismissed, but a a wide variety of other impacts that systemic racism can have. Toxic stress, epigenetics, access to care. One of the things that we know in research is that even a highly educated woman of color, college educated, perhaps she has her doctorate degree, a master's, she is still at greater risk than a high school educated white woman. And I think that speaks to the racism that we're talking about. And that leads to poor outcomes. If you're dismissed, if you're not believed, if you're not taken seriously, you know, research shows that there is still some belief out there among uh, some providers that um, Black women can't feel pain. And so they're maybe not given proper pain management or, and so there's still some really devastating and awful, awful, deadly consequences Mm -hmm. to this in our country and especially in the South. Yeah. Deadly to both um, mom, that, that parent and that baby. You know, we attend labors all over the nation and we're often hired by people who recognize the problematic pieces of the healthcare system, but still have a desire to birth within the hospital system. And with our clients of color, we certainly have to approach things differently. We often have to advocate way, way more than we do with a white client. It should not be this hard. Not at all. Barriers that continue to persist. It should not be this hard. Barriers from access to care. Um, Is there a birthing hospital on your bus line, perhaps, or all of the barriers that are put up in the social determinants of health that can really create poor outcomes um, continue to persist in this country? And they're quite easily fixable if we think about it. These are all things that we don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel. Either we do have them in big, large cities and we just need to replicate them, or they are something that other countries have successfully done that we could go and say, hey, we're going to take this model and bring it back to our nation. That's unfortunate. It's always harrowing when we have to think about our government's role in our in our healthcare and the things that are allowed to persist. Okay. I have a question. You had mentioned drinking cold water. I know there's a lot of people out there that were like, I drank cold water and my baby jumped in. It was fine. Talk to us about some of these common myths that people might be told either by their doctor, their doula, their friends, you know, the old people in their birthing communities that are just filled with knowledge. What are you hearing that are like, you know, good in intention, but actually aren't evidence-based in monitoring the well-being of your baby. Absolutely. So I guess one place that I would start is that the reason why a change in a baby's movements are important and why they're a red flag is because babies are just like us. If we are not feeling well, if we have COVID or the flu or a really bad cold, as adults, we want to lay on the couch. We want to lay in bed. We become weaker. That's how we handle just being in distress or not, or not feeling well. It's the same thing for babies. If they're not doing well, their movements will change. That's the 
earliest indication that your baby might be in distress. So there's a problem arising with your pregnancy or with your baby. And the reason why I bring that up is because one of the common myths we hear is, oh, just drink some orange juice or just drink some cold water. Well, if you think about it as adults, if we just drink some cold water when we have COVID or the flu, that doesn't actually cure us. That doesn't actually make us better, right? There are a wide variety of things that need to take place to make us better. So it's the same thing for babies. Drinking cold water is an artificial, you know, thing that can happen. And it maybe it makes the baby move for five seconds, but it's not going to prevent whatever is causing them distress, like an umbilical cord complication or a fetal maternal hemorrhage or things like that. It's an artificial way, just like eating a candy bar or something like that might give you a quick boost, but it's not going to cure what's ailing you. Um, Other misconceptions are your baby's just running out of room. So many people, especially I would say grandparents, aunts, uncles, they might say, "Your you're just near in the end of pregnancy. Babies run out of room. But the thing is, is that babies should move up to and even during labor, that if your baby's movements are slowing or stopping, or you even have um, a frantic, um, violent movement at one in one episode, that is not normal. Your baby should move up to and even during labor, and they should have that consistent pattern. And that's why it's so important to know your baby's normal and get to know what it is, because then you'll know when something is really off. Okay, knowing that pattern in your baby, I think is something that nobody gets told about, right? I think the most common one that I hear is, oh, your baby's just slowing down because they are running out of room. I literally tweak out, I have a little cringe moment where I'm like, actually, no, it's always that awkward moment of how do I gently insert myself into this conversation? But also I could never let someone walk away thinking that that was true because it could be such an indicator of, you know, complication. So I, I suppose I have a question about counting the kicks. And then after this, I want to talk about what does it actually mean to count the kicks? What's that process Mm -hmm. look like? But how would counting the kicks tell us that your baby's cord is compressed? For example, I know there's a lot of people out there thinking, okay, if I'm counting my baby's kicks at the same time every day, you know, how will it know if the cord is compressed early that morning? If my counting the kicks is later that afternoon. Mm -hmm. I think you can count kicks more than once a day. If you want, if you feel like something is off you and you want to get in touch with them, you can, you know, uh, I hope you're already using our count, our free count the kicks app, but you can pay attention and, and always speak up. Even if you haven't been counting or, you know, getting to know your baby's normal, but you feel like something is off, you should call your provider. Don't hesitate, go to labor and delivery, call your doctor and let them know something has drastically changed for you. And so the reason how this detects those kinds of things is When a a mom is empowered to go to her doctor, go to her triage unit and say, listen, I've been paying attention and something is off. There's a wide variety of things that doctor or that nurse can do at that time. Things like perform an ultrasound, run a biophysical profile, do a non-stress test. And there are a lot of things that doctors can see in that. So biophysical profile, there are going to be lots of different points of your baby's health that your doctor is looking at. An ultrasound, a doctor can actually look and see what's happening. Is that baby moving or not? We have a story of a mom in our community who is using our app religiously every single day in the third trimester. She knew that it took 10 minutes on average every day to get to 10 movements with her baby. She had a normal, wonderful, healthy checkup on a Monday afternoon afternoon, 37 weeks along in pregnancy. The very next day, it was a Tuesday. She's counting again, paying attention. She notices a change in her baby's normal. The baby that would normally give her 10 movements in 10 minutes every single day now was only giving her three subtle movements in two hours. Mom knew this was totally off. And this is the kind of mom who could have absolutely said, I just saw her on the ultrasound. I just saw that my fluids are great. I just had a great checkup. I'm not going to bother my doctor. I'm just going to maybe keep watching this and stay home. Instead, because she was informed and using the Count the Kicks app, she called her doctor and said, I was just there yesterday, but something's really off today. Luckily, that doctor said, come on back in. We're going to check you out. When they hooked that baby up to the ultrasound, who was just there on the ultrasound, totally healthy the day before, what they noticed on this Tuesday was baby could no longer move her ligaments. She wasn't moving her fingers or her toes. And so this ultrasound let that doctor know and make an informed decision that 
this is not normal. This baby should be moving at 37 weeks along. It is not normal to not be able to move your ligaments, your fingers or your toes. So the doctor using that ultrasound made the informed decision that this mom needed an emergency C-section. Of course, we don't want a C-section as our first choice, but in this case, this baby had to get there and had to get there pretty quickly. So he performed the emergency C-section. And when he pulled that baby out of mama, the cord was wrapped tightly around her neck three times. And that was what was restricting her movement. And so when baby was delivered, he looked at mom and he said, congratulations, you saved your baby's life. You had every reason to stay home. Uh, You just had a healthy checkup and you're looking at the color of your baby. You maybe have four, five, six hours left. It was that close. And we get a lot of stories like that where doctors know it was a really close call. Maybe that baby had a few hours. Maybe that baby had a day until there was a different outcome. And that's why it's so critical. And that's why there are things doctors can do if you go in and say, I've noticed a change. There are a variety of things that doctor can do to investigate because maybe your baby's having an off day. Truly, maybe your baby is having an off day. That does happen, but at least you know. And every doctor that I've ever talked to would much rather, much rather have you come in and and, and get checked out than come in a week later for your r- routine checkup and your baby's gone. Like they want you to come in They want to perform the proper tests. And if nothing's wrong, awesome. Go home, keep monitoring. Fantastic. It took an hour out of your day, out of their day. No big deal. And so I would continue to encourage women, if you feel like something's off, there's a variety of things your providers can do that are non-invasive, an ultrasound, non-invasive, that can get to the bottom of what's happening if something is happening. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So powerful. I agree. I kind of tend to think along the same lines. People are like, oh, what if it's nothing? And if it's nothing, then great. Your baby looks awesome. And unfortunately, you're just like, I had to take the afternoon off work. Darn. You know, although I do respect that sometimes that is very problematic. The 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 worst case scenario is we go in and your baby is fine and you leave again. And you have that peace of mind of knowing that your baby is safe and good and okay. And was just exactly you what you're saying, having an off day. Many times too, cords around the neck are not a problem. We know that one in three babies have cords around the neck. We also know that one in two times is kind of what constitutes the uncomplicated. But when we get three and four times around the neck, it becomes very complicated. And these babies do get really limited in their range of motion and in kind of where they can flip and turn. And much like you said, babies are designed to be always moving in that womb up until, you know, the time of labor. So I love that you point out, you know, knowing your baby's patterns and really don't be afraid to just show up and say something is wrong, right? You don't have to call. You don't need permission. I know a lot of times we can call our offices and they may say like, oh, just drink a glass of water or do some juice. You don't need permission to go see your provider. You can just show up and say something is wrong. I need some help. So you had mentioned that this provider in this story was really receptive and was really, you know, good about getting this mom back and and being like, yes, let me run all the tests. And if it's nothing, then great, you go home. But if it's something, then we, at least you're here. What do we say to providers or how would you suggest someone advocate for themselves if they're working with a provider who is reluctant, although that mom's intuition is pretty sure something is wrong? Is there anything short of just showing up and saying, I'm here and I'm not leaving? I think that's fantastic advice to say here and I'm not leaving and be be very adamant. I understand that's hard though for some women because they're used to being dismissed. So one of the things I would suggest is we know from evidence that women who show up with our app, with the Count the Kicks app and say, look, I've been using this. I have been paying attention. I know my normal doctors and nurses go, oh, she does know. She does know what she's talking about. She has the data to back up her intuition. And that's one thing that Count the Kicks does. Oh, I just got like full body chills. That's amazing. Okay. I love it. Obviously I'm like a data junkie. So just like when you were like, you know, I have this log, I was like, 
data points. Amazing. All right. I know that we've hinted at it and we've kind of talked about bits and pieces of counting the kicks, but it is a process. It is an actual thing that you follow because the process works. So can you talk us through what are the components to counting the kicks? What are the data points we are collecting? And then also how will that play into make up your baby's quote unquote pattern for people who are like, what in the world is my baby's pattern? Absolutely. The best thing to do is to show you and talk you through how our app works. So it's called Count the Kicks. It has a yellow and red icon in your app store, both Google Play and iTunes. And you just hit the start counting button and you are going to tell the app if you're counting for single babies or twins, because you can count for twins on our app as well. So during your daily kick counting session, how you're going to get to know your normal is every time you feel a movement, a kick, a jab, a roll, the app is going to time how long it takes to get to 10 movements. So we'll kind of tap this little footprint here. Every time I feel a movement, I'm not pregnant, but we'll pretend like I am. And so we'll kind of go through it probably more quickly than normal. And after you get to 10 movements, the app is also going to ask you the strength of your baby's movements. And you do it on a scale of fluttery to fierce or one to five. So let's pretend our baby was extra strong today. So I'm going to give it a five. Then you hit finish session and you're going to see up here the average of what your baby's strength is. And then down here, the graph is going to show you the average amount of time it took your baby to get to 10 movements. So these are the data points you're talking about. If, if I were pregnant and counting on a normal daily basis, it would say, okay, today it took five minutes to get to 10 movements, five minutes, four minutes, five minutes, six minutes, all roughly around the same amount of time. Again, I'm not pregnant, so this is not normal. But if all of a sudden my five minute baby took um, three hours to get to 10 movements, this graph is going to shoot way up and be a visual cue. The app stores three weeks of your kit counting history. And so you can go back and see what your normal has been. But you will, if, if I were counting daily, you would see a pretty consistent trend line here and you would know, okay, your average amount is five minutes a day and your average strength is a five on a scale of one to five. You can always go in there and see your history. And so these are, those are the data points that it collects. Um, in order to set up a profile, it'll ask you things like your due date. It's available in 16 languages, so you can count in up to 16 languages. And again, you can count for twins. You can uh, switch between counting for baby A and counting for baby B. I know sometimes that feels a little complicated, but moms really can kind of recognize the difference or recognize who's who in the belly. And so that's really exciting. One thing that is sometimes hard is having an interior placenta. We do get mm. that question a lot. And I had that with my daughter seven years ago. And I would say the movements were probably more subtle, but you're, I was still able to count. And so if you have questions about anterior placenta, I would definitely talk to your doctor about it during appointments and sort of how to pay attention to movements when you have an anterior placenta. Nice. Okay. And it should be done at relatively the same time each day. Is that correct? That is correct. And there's even some research out there that shows counting at night is ideal, that healthy babies tend to be more active at night. And so of course they do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When you're trying to sleep or whatever. So I, and a part of me wonders, I don't, this isn't scientific, but part of me wonders, like so many of us are just moving on the go all day long. And so our movement maybe kind of rocks them to sleep during yeah. the day. And then at night when you're sitting down and you're getting ready for bed or you just finished dinner, when you're sitting down, the baby's like awake and like ready to give you all their movements, right? <laughs> ready to party. And so, you know, counting around dinner time or after dinner time or just before bed, I think is a great option if if you have, if you're if you're able, if that works in your schedule. Cool. Is there an average kind of duration of time that you kind of see those 10 kicks or is it truly as individual as your fingerprint? It truly is as individual as your fingerprint. There are some babies that take four minutes on average to get to 10 movements. And then there are some babies that take 24 minutes on average to get to 10 movements. And so that old adage of as long as you get 10 movements in two hours is very outdated. It is bad okay. advice. Do not practice 10 and two that as long as you felt 10 movements in two hours, that's another myth. That's a misconception that maybe was okay 40, 50 years ago. It's not okay now because for some babies giving you 10 movements in two hours is not normal. Maybe they typically give you 40 movements in two hours. And so 10 movements would not be normal for that baby. And so that's why our evidence-based method that is proven to work, our organization started have reduced 
reduced our still birth rate by 32% while the rest of the country remains stagnant. It's proven to work that if you get to know your baby's normal this way, and this is a, a proven best way to get to know your baby's normal, that babies can in fact be saved. Lives can be saved and babies can get here safely. You saw that impact of lower stillbirth rates more significantly in people of color too in Iowa, didn't you? We did. In the first five years, there was a stillbirth rate reduction of 39% among Black women in just five years. And so we're so proud. We are so proud of that. And it was a community of doctors listening to women and nurses right. listening to women and women of color getting, you know, getting this kind of information and education and tools and resources and, and in an empowering way. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. Okay. So is there a duration of time that's problematic? If you're not getting 10 in one hour, should we be concerned? How might you know, like, that's what my baby's normal is. They're a lazier baby. They're a chiller baby. They're a calmer baby versus like, okay, I think this might be problematic just because it's problematic in general. Well, that's a great question. I, I do think it does come back to knowing your baby's normal. And so if you're consistently, if it's consistently taking your baby two hours to get to 10 movements or three hours to get to 10 movements each day, that might be something you want to talk to your doctor about if it's taking three hours or so that you would want to talk to them about. But I would continue to encourage, get to know their normal, that average amount of time it takes to get to 10 and speak up to your doctor if that normal changes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then I think another question that came to my mind is if stillbirth is defined as 20 weeks to birth, and then we are starting counting the kicks at around 28, 30 weeks, what assurance or reassurance, maybe there's nothing for people who are in that 20th to 28th week, you know, not everybody too is going to feel those first baby movements as early as maybe your friends or your neighbors or your sister. So hang tight for those. And Emily, you mentioned a little bit earlier that anterior placenta, it can make those first movements a little duller or even appear like they came a little later, you guys. So just like take a deep breath there. Also, fun fact, those first movements are called quickenings, which I always found so fascinating. But for the people 20 to 28 weeks, what are we doing? Um, research shows that babies don't actually have a pattern until about 26 okay. weeks or 28 weeks. And so doctors and ACOG recommend starting to pay attention to your baby's movements at 26 weeks if you're high risk or 28 weeks if you're an otherwise healthy pregnancy. And the only reason why they don't recommend it at 20 weeks is because babies don't quite have their pattern yet. They haven't really established it. So if you don't know their pattern, it could cause a lot of anxiety because they just don't have a pattern yet. So you wouldn't quite know, you know, one day it could be a little off, right? It could be today took 10 minutes, today took 30 minutes, but it's only because they just don't have a pattern yet. And so that's the best advice that we've seen. Yeah. Cool. Well, women's health and, and birth are things that are still being explored because they just haven't been a priority in the past or the priority that they have been has been a very skewed, you know, kind of biased thing that has happened. So we run into it a lot on this podcast where we don't have all the answers, but here's what we do have. Yeah. Um, okay. So exciting. You guys have an app. You told us a little bit about it. Is there anything else that we need to know? Is it downloadable for Android and iPhone? Anybody who's pregnant can kind of access it. Absolutely. Anyone can access it. Partners can also use it. So if you want to share logins with your partner and at night or on the weekends, you sit down together and your partner, you know, holds on to your belly and, and taps the footprint for you. It's what a great way. Siblings can do it. Grandparents can do it. It's a great way to bond. So it's available in Apple and Android. So in your app stores, it'll be there. It's free in both stores, totally free. As long as I live, this app will be totally free for mamas to use. Again, it's in 16 languages. There are no apps. Ads, there are no pop-ups. We're a nonprofit that simply wants you to pay attention to your baby's movements every day. So no ads, no pop-ups. We do not sell your information. We do not share your information. It is a very secure platform. We simply want you to have your daily kit counting session and get to know your baby's normal and be empowered to speak up if you notice a change. That's our goal. That's what we care about. So we're not selling your information. We're not sharing it with anyone. And it's very secure and you're not going to get hit with pop-ups and things like that. Gosh, I want to like high five you through the screen. Right <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> Emily, this has been such an informative 
conversation. I have never been pregnant. And so I know I'm coming to this from a very privileged place compared to our listeners who are pregnant. I did not find this conversation scary. And I actually typically cry at a lot of, a lot of conversations that involve loss and, and when it involves people being hurt or, you know, emotionally I didn't cry. And so I wanted to just say thank you for being able to hold this space for people to have this conversation that can be very scary and triggering and sometimes really overwhelming, even emotional. And you, you like walk us through it without all those big, scary emotions. So just thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. And I know a lot of our listeners are thinking the same thing. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Is there anything else that you want to leave our audience with? Just be empowered. Don't take no for an answer. If you feel like something is off and you feel like your provider isn't listening to you, find a new one. You have every right to find a new one or find a second opinion. And that's part of our work at Count the Kicks. It's it's twofold, right? It's get to know your normal and speak up when you notice a change. And so that second part is critical. You have to be listened to. You have to be taken care of when you feel like something is off. And so what I would leave your listeners with today is empowerment to speak up, empowerment to not take no for an answer. It's your baby. It is your baby. You know your body best and you know your baby best. Heck yeah. I love that so much. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. I will see you next week for another episode of the Birth Logic Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, head over to the podcast. And if you're listening to us on the podcast, head over to YouTube to see Emily and I's beautiful face. (laughs) I will see you next time. Until then. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next time on the Birth Knowledge Podcast. Until then, head over to Instagram and find us at Tranquility by Hehe and give us a follow. You can also check us out at thebirthlounge.com.